Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Google Talks. I am your moderator, Lindawi Davis, and today we're talking to an amazing author. Um, she is the author of a book called Black Widow, a sad journey through uh, grief for people who normally avoid books with words like journey in the title. Um, just to give you a little bit of insight here, the author's name is Leslie Gray Streeter. She's a veteran journalist and dynamite author. And a direct quote here is, Black Widow is for anyone who has lost someone. Although grief is universal, Leslie realized there wasn't anyone reflecting a black voice in this space when she lost her husband unexpectedly. So today we're gonna to get into a beautiful chat around grief, around the book, love, loss, recovering. And for everyone that's tuning into the live stream, just a quick housekeeping note here, you can actually drop your questions or comments um, inside of the live stream. Um, and we're so looking forward to all of the energy that um, we're gonna be generating from this talk. Um, and we hope you all enjoy it. And with that, let's welcome Leslie Gray Streeter. Hi. Hi, Leslie. How are you? I am wonderful. It's nice to see your face. Thank you. It's nice to be seen when you're in the house all the time. Absolutely. So, absolutely. This like, is I see you. <laughs> human. Yeah. As I was saying before we started here, I'm loving this purple. Um, it's such a wonderful mm -hmm. color. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully everyone can kind of feel that light and radiance there. Oh, I love it. Having like a full face like on of, of makeup is like not a thing that I've done a lot in the last eight to 10 weeks, but I'm really happy. And all the makeup that I've bought, that I bought hoping I was going on tour and stuff was like, eh! so now <laughs> I can actually use it. I got these earrings for this. I got right. this. It's a whole situation. So now I can actually justify the money I spent on it. Listen, I like it. You got to treat yourself. Don't cheat yourself. A friend of mine tells me that all the time. So um, mm -hmm. I am with it for sure. Um, you know, Leslie, I kind of wanted to start us off just by you giving us a brief summary of what this book is about and why you felt compelled to kind of share this excavation of grief um, with everyone. Excellent. The book is a memoir. It's about the first year of my widowhood um, in 2015. From 2015 to 2016, um, my husband died in 2015. And it just literally follows almost exactly the first year of sort of my what the and then right. the sort of the stages of grief, which are honestly, which are not, they don't run concurrent. They, run, they kind of slap you in the face and run all around the place. And it's sort of my going through that and then sort of trying to reestablish what life looked like as a single parent. Um, I was finishing the adoption of our child by myself unexpectedly, moving in with my mother um, when we moved in together um, and having a co-parent and just sort of figuring out what it was to be this word, this widow word that no one ever expects or certainly doesn't ever want to have described them, but I did. And so that's what the book is about. But it's also funny. I would pitch it to people and they would go, oh no, it sounds really depressing. I go, yeah, but it's funny. And they go, it's right. funny. <laughs> like, is it, is it like a, nothing against Tyler Perry, but is it like, I think they were imagining like, you know, a Medea thing where people were like, you know, crying and jumping in the casket and that kind of thing. And certainly right. I've had that in my family, um, but not at this particular funeral. Um, right. So it was more like I process things humorously, sometimes inappropriately. And it just kind of, I just wrote it. And I didn't think about, is this appropriate? Or I just wanted it to make sense to me and then mm -hmm. hope that it would make sense to other people. And that's sort of, what happened. Absolutely. I think the great thing about something key that you just said here is, you know, appropriate, right? What's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And I, obviously when it comes to grief, you know, the five stages of grief, there's, there's no linear kind of line that you go yeah. through these things. Um, so, and you and I were just briefly talking about this before we jumped on, but I, I you know, I, I had went through my own tragedy about 16 years ago when it came to my mom passing. And this book was really, it really was therapy um, with just bits of laughter. And so I really want you to kind of touch on what you couldn't say, what can you say about yourself now and what you learned that you couldn't say to yourself at that time that this tragedy happened? I can say now that I know that you get 
through it. My uncle, when my grandfather died, he said, you don't get past it, but you do get through it. Meaning there's not something where we go, I'm completely over it and it'll never bother me again. And I'll never hear the wrong song or see the wrong Hallmark commercial and sob because it takes you right back there to that moment. That right. will happen, but you will continue your life and maybe build blocks to a new one. And I said in the beginning, I knew that had to happen because I had no choice but to, but now I really know that it, it can. I kind of, you say that like, I'm a finish this, you know, um, I'm I'm a finish this diet, and then you don't right. run diet, you know, <laughs> um, things like that are. I'm gonna run as fast as I can in this 5K. You're kind of like walking. You're at the end of it. Um, but I knew I had to. I just hoped that I believed it. And there were moments where I was like, "You are full of it. There's no way, or you'll get through it, but you won't be. You won't be you anymore. You won't be. You won't have your sense of humor. You won't have a sense of." Um, of self and it'll just be sad and and depressing and awful and right. laugh again and I would go out and laughing and then I would laugh like during the thing and go okay that's just nervous laughter or depressed laughter or too many glasses of wine laughter and sometimes it was and then sometimes it was just like in the beginning uh when I'm eating the chips in the graveyard looking for a, a place to bury Scott and my mother's like don't drip chips on the dead people and that's funny Right, and it, right. Made us, and it made us laugh, or my Scott's cousin doing the Jefferson sing along that I knew nothing about um, at the funeral, and that mm -hmm. made everyone laugh. And that's Scott did that at funerals. He made people feel better about things, or he would. I mean, I said this to someone before. I imagine, and I don't know about your mom's funeral, but that I've never been to a funeral where something didn't happen that at least distracted you, like someone that nobody liked showed up and you went, mm, "Why is she here?" Or right. like. Somebody right. said the wrong thing or someone dropped their shoe or it just whatever. They brought the wrong potato salad, whatever it was. <laughs> a thing happens. And I think that focusing all the on all those things got me to where I am today, which is to say, I know that I, I'm OK. I'm still I'm never going to it's never going to be OK that he right. does. That's never right. going to be OK. I've made peace with the fact that it happened because I can't do anything about that. Um, um, but that, that's what I've learned that I, I, I wasn't full of it when I said I could do it. Right, right. Um, no, I'm in total agreement with you that the, I think the biggest piece of advice that I gave myself and I now give to other people who are having a hard time is that you're never going to actually, there's no such thing as, oh, you'll, you'll get, this will be over. It's mm -hmm. never going to be over. It's just you get better at understanding and utilizing your time to understand why this happened because you 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 may not even get the the answers right Absolutely. Um, when you're going through a tragedy why was it important for you though to um write this book and really put that lens on it that this is this is a book that was that is written by a black person and not yeah. a black book yes and it's interesting because since i wrote and, and before the book came out another book called from scratch by timby Locke came Ooh. out which is amazing do you know the book no, I know the name. I know the yeah. name. And mm -hmm. it, it's a book about written by an African-American woman who married a white guy and he died and she writes about the aftermath. But it's a completely different book because everyone else gets the chance. How many movies and books are there that are similar, but everyone gets the chance, but they're spinning it. Um, her book is also a travelogue. It's amazing. It's she, Her husband was Italian from Italy. And right. in the book, she, she goes to Italy with their child and the time after he dies of cancer to be reconnected with the place where they met to reconnect her daughter to his family and to connect through food and family some sense of getting through the grief which is a completely different book than the book i wrote but right. i think some people would go well it's two books about black widows and a white dude and whatever but it's different at the time that i wrote my book that i started the book i didn't know about her book and i did a lot of research um because they ask you when you're submitting books um, for consideration for um, for agents to write comps. Like, you know, what is out there that's like this book? Why is my book needed in this place? And I found a lot of grief memoirs and yeah. I found memoirs by people who were black, but most of the books by people who were black were specifically about the struggle. They were specifically about a history of racism or of specific sociological things. And they weren't super funny usually. And they were, yeah. there wasn't, I did not find a lot of books about a book about a widow who happened to be black or a book right. about aging or dating in your forties or um, 
changing your economic circumstance. I didn't find those books that just happened to be written by someone who was not white. Right. And I was like, I can do that. I'm not white. Right. I'll write my book. Mm -hmm. um, and I have found so much worth in all those books. Like I, um, Joan Didion's Year of Magical Thinking is like the grief memoir. You know, our lives are nothing alike other than that we've lost, we lost our husbands and we had to figure out how to write our way through it. It's a beautiful book. It doesn't, it's not the same thing. And what I tried to do, um, when you, you mentioned, yeah, what I had said about it's a book by a black person, not a black book, because people would say, so who is this book for? Right. Say, it's for people who read books. You know, I mean, right. I like, in the same time, I like the fact that there were things I wrote about that I didn't want to explain too much because I didn't want it to be for, for the gaze of people who are not us. So it was just writing to explain everything about being black to those people. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like, this is who I am. This is the kind of thing that I do. Um, and this is who I am as a black person. My black is in the book. My black experience is different than yours. It's different from your cousins who lives in a different place than you. It's different from, I would say my, I have a twin sister. Yep. And I can't even say that I have the exact same experience as the woman who was born from the same womb as me and raised by my parents at the same time. Cause right. we're different people. So all that is to say that I wanted people to meet me where I was in the same way that people met Nia Vidalos when she did my Big Fat Greek Wedding. And they said, I've, expect, I've accepted that this is an experience that I don't know everything about. And she's explaining some stuff, but also she's just gonna let some stuff fly. Right. And Greek people, I, my friends who were Greek went, ah, you know. <laughs> um, and when I read things on, on Twitter about like Frankie Beverly um, yeah. and, my friends who are not necessarily of my community will go, who's Frankie Beverly? I go, that's okay. I'll explain it. But I like that the people like on Twitter, they don't explain who Frankie Beverly is. They just go, and then your uncle was in the yards uh, dancing before I let go. And be like, absolutely. Ah. absolutely. It's, that's what I wanted. And I wanted people, because when I watched my big, my big fat Greek wedding, it was important enough to me that I looked it up. I said, well, I don't understand what this thing is. Let me look it up. And I think that hopefully in my book, people go, what is she talking about? Who to Jason? What? Right, right. What that is. Um, well, I think that that's how people, you know, when you're associated and become exposed to uh, cultural references, colloquialisms, et cetera, it really is an opportunity to just learn a bit more right. um, about the person, about their community. But then also, grief is a universal thing, right? Absolutely. This is Absolutely. That is part of the human condition. Um, and I kind of wanted to touch on um, denial, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, one of the quotes that really kind of jumped out at me as I was reading, um, let me read it here. Denial is a hell of a drug. And I kept thinking, it sure is. It's a hell of a yeah. drug when it comes to changing your life, oh when it God. comes to to uh, getting into the gym, whatever medium you may be trying yes. to jump into, but particularly when it comes to grief and loss, what about denial for you um, actually worked in your advantage? Were there any aspects of the shock and the fear and the avoidance um, that actually kind of pushed you through? Oh, yeah. And I think, and I put some of this in the book, I think that the denial and the shock initially helped me be able to do things that if I was really um, aware and had it really broken through exactly, like in the first couple of hours, first couple of days mm -hmm. after he died, I would have been like, I'm just gonna go cry now, y'all figure it out. Um, I, like I wrote about the gentleman that I interviewed years ago who let me interview him about his wife dying and said, listen, I know that I'm in shock because I and I wanna do this because I'd like to tell people about her. But if you call me three, three, week, three hours from now, right. and we really have said it and I'll be destroyed and I won't be able to help. So I really think things like picking up the phone and calling people and saying, look, this whole Scott died and saying the words. Cause once I was conscious of it, I couldn't say it. I couldn't say, I couldn't say my phone died. I used to say my, my battery is needing a charge or something. You know, I would just make stuff up. I would just basically go 0% help me. You know, that was so even the word dying was there dying there and dead. But I, I powered through having to do it, having the, you know, in those first couple hours, you know, even like I write about not remembering who I called and that my friend showed up at my house and, and I thought she just showed up because we were supposed to go walking. She goes, no, you called me and told me that Scott had died. And I was like, I have no memory of that phone call. 
Right. But my brain kind of like, I talk about put you in the bubble wrap and went, okay, do what you need to do to get through this. And that's, that's really all I could do. Um, And then, like I said, by the time people got to me and were able to be the buffer, Mm -hmm. um, it was, that was helpful because then I could just go. But then you can't completely, you know, because like with your mom, I'm sure you yeah. still have to be in some way the person who told you where to put the chicken and greeted people when they came into the funeral and right. all people and was the acceptor of the I'm so sorry. And you can't do that if you're lying on the floor. This um, is very true. Um, you know, there were many things that spoke to me about um you know, just kind of surviving the day and surviving the circumstances around it. Um, mm-hmm. I think that uh, <laughs> there were moments where, you know, for myself, I, it took me a year to sleep in my bed, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, took me an entire year to do that, um, which for someone who's never really experienced any kind of anxiety or anything like that at that time, um, that was just shocking for me, you know. Mm-hmm. But I kind of want to touch on something that you brought up, which is support, right? Yeah. So in the book, you talk a bit about um, a lot of your friends, so folks that yeah. kind of talk out to me, um, your sister, Lynn. Yes. Um, Jay. Yes. And then, of course, your ride or die, Lauren. Talk Lauren, yes. I hope all of, of you are watching. I yeah. hope you're watching, yes. <laughs> talk to us about um, some of the um, support and how that support really helped you and why it's important to have support systems when you're in any kind of um, tragedy. Okay, I will say this because someone said, well, how do you get all the support? And I go, live your life like a person that people want to be friends with. And then when something bad happens to you, hopefully they'll show up. Right. And that moment, you can't go, God, I wish I had been nicer to people and they wanted to come and hang out with me. Right, right. And, and, and you don't do that just so it's not a quick record. I'm being nice to you, okay? So when a tragedy happens, <laughs> you will show up and bring a cake. Um, right. But I think that I just, I have really amazing friends. And so many of those friends have been my friend for a very long time. And Mm -hmm. they just, like, when I said people just showed up, like literally that night when um, my friend Melanie just was there in my living room, because I didn't even know that my sister had left the house. She left the house and got her from the, I think, or she took a cab, I don't know. People just showed up and Nikki came and um, Jason, you know, said, I'll come when everybody leaves. And Lauren Lauren literally was there. And I, I put in the book that she came, she didn't even answer the phone and I kept calling and her husband yeah. was like, oh, someone's calling. That she never ever said, this is too much. Mm-hmm. No, no one in my family ever said, even when it was clear that it was getting too much and they need to go back to their lives or whatever, they never said that. They never said, this is too much. Um, and I hope I never have to have anything happen in my life that's bad yeah. Where I have to. I mean, all those people gathered like right before the book came out. And I did this um, event on Palm Beach at the Colony Hotel, which is where we got married. It was the same. It was our 10th anniversary weekend. Mm-hmm. And instead of celebrating my my anniversary, I was being interviewed on stage by James Patterson, which is cool. Um, yep. I wish that Scott had been there because I know he's somewhere going ah, missing all of this. It's like you missed right. all stuff. Mm-hmm. But all those people, they all came back. Jason came back and Lauren was there and my sister was there and Melanie was there. The only one who could make it was Nikki, but everybody showed up. Yeah. And it was, um, it's, it's tempting to say, oh, that means I'm an awesome person. I don't think it does. It means that those people love me and I'm right. awesome because I'm loved by those people. I love that. I love that. I mean, the writer dies are your, your writer dies, your bays, your, Close oh. friends, the fam bam. These are people that are, they're going to show up regardless, right? I and have so many friends, like my friend Kim, who's in the book, the one who sort of like, this is what we're doing. And we went, okay, this is what we're doing. Um, she, we've always talked about, you know, if somebody calls you and you go, be outside at three o'clock, stand there. Okay, I'm going to be there. I don't know where we're going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, hopefully, it's not illegal. Um, right. But, <laughs> You right. know, you just kind of show up for people and it's like, I'll worry about what it's about later. Isn't that the simplest thing a person can do in someone else's life? It, these are not things that are hard things to do. It, no. you know, it doesn't take a big plan to show up in someone's life. No. Uh, I kind of wanted to shift a little bit and touch on um, the anger portion, right? Uh, yeah. So, you know, anger, we're talking about frustration. We're talking about hesitation. Um, 
Talk to us a little bit about giving yourself permission to be angry because this happens, but also be angry at the fact that um, there were attributes, and you talk about this in the book of, of um, Scott uh, taking a little bit better care yeah. um, of health. It's you know, it's, one of, it's one of those things where as a woman, you're told it you don't if you're angry as a woman, mm -hmm. you're well, I'm not gonna say the word, but you know what word I'm you know referring to. Yeah. Or <laughs> you're mean or you're selfish, or how dare you and why can't you just whatever? And if mm -hmm. you're a man, it's passion and it's it's dedication and he's being authentic, whatever that right. you know? so I knew that when I wrote the book, I had to be honest. If I was like, if I'm going to do this, there's nothing worse than reading a memoir and knowing that someone took a giant red marker through all the interesting things. Yeah. I'm like, why am I reading this? I'm not a celebrity. Uh -huh. No one cares about me. But, and I wasn't going to write things that were like people's business. Like, do you watch Queen Sugar? I do. I wasn't going to be Nova and write all of my family secrets. <laughs> so I don't watch Queen Sugar. Like, literally, when the book was coming, when book was coming out, and that there was basically this show called Queen Sugar, this woman who writes, who's amazing, but she's very much, I'm writing my truth. And she writes every nasty secret of everyone in her family, and she doesn't tell them. Right. So she puts the book out, and suddenly when a book is out, she's like trying to hide copies of the book, and they're like, oh, no, no, no. And they all read it, and she's like, but I was writing about my truth. So right. mm -hmm. I, I didn't want, I let everyone who had a significant part in my book got their chapter before I even turned it in mm -hmm. because I wanted it. And there's some things that didn't wind up in the book, but at least right. those people know that it's out there in the world. And I wrote about it. Um, and I, I, I tell that story to say that I knew I wanted to be honest about things and anger, one of the stages of grief, yeah. and something that's super valid because it is, being angry at a dead person is really fruitless. True. But understanding that you are angry, I'll say staying angry at a dead person is mm -hmm. fruitless. Mm -hmm. Understanding mm -hmm. that you are angry at them for whatever reason, so you can move on because you are not dead and because right. you have to keep going and you got to talk to their family and you still love them and you got to raise their child and live in the house and like not burn all their stuff. You know, that's not, right. we, were, we were making out when we, when he died. I mean, we were literally in a really good place when he died. So it wasn't that we weren't like mad at each other. Right. At the moment, But the anger um, around, yeah, that, you know, you think you're, um, you're immortal. And when you're in your mid forties, even though you know, you have some health issues, unless he'd not been hospitalized, it wasn't, mm -hmm. like he didn't have like a morphine trip or whatever. It wasn't the kind of thing where, even though he knew some of these things, it wasn't like this is imminent. Or if you eat this cheese stick, you're one cheese stick away from a heart attack. No one right. said that. So you just don't, no. And so you assume that you're okay. So when your wife gives you a dirty look as you're ordering the cheesesteak and you're like, Ugh. so when you die and your wife is going, cause of course, you know, we're women. So we blame ourselves right. you know? or right. we say, and I'm also, I'm a control freak. So I'm like, what could I have done? Could I have done anything? Mm -hmm. And you're like, you feel like you have to save the person and you can't. And it's like, um, I, one of my cousins wasn't able to come to the funeral because she'd had a heart attack right before he died and she's fine, but right. she wasn't able to come and she called me and she said, so how you doing? And I said, well, you know, I feel like I know what it's like in those movies when the person's like just manic and angry and they dig up the dead person and they reanimate them and then they become a zombie and they kill everybody. And my, my cousin went, Girl, you, you can't do that. You got all these fancy parties. How you gonna take that with you to a party? You can't have that with you on, on beach. How you take a zombie with you? Right. right. It, it was so ridiculous, but it was acknowledging, yes, that it was a frustrating, awful situation that I had right. no control over. And I got to be angry and bitter and desperate about it, understanding that I could not actually bring him back to life and put him in a thing and take him with me to a to the Ritz Carlton. Yeah, I mean, I, I 
there's something that um, there were so many delicious like nuggets and quotes that were in the book. One of the things that spoke to me, and it's again, it's something that's so simple, but just to read the quote directly, you can only make decisions on information you, you have at the moment, and it doesn't help anyone to beat yourself up over it. I just wish that we had more time. So my, my question on that is, do you find that you now focus more on how much time you may have or is your focus more on how you spend your time? It is both. It is that at 49, I just turned 49 last month. All right. Um, thank you. Um, no. I'm very <laughs> conscious of um, that I am not immortal. I'm very yeah. conscious of that. I bought myself a blood pressure thingy and um, I'm on Zoom, Noom, Noom. I'm on Zoom, I'm on Noom right now. Right. Um, mm -hmm doing that thing, trying to lose that weight. Cause I was like, you go, I was trying to do it myself and I lost weight and it's in the book. I gained a lot of weight and I'd lost about 20 pounds of that. And then I gained like 10 of it back. So it's kind of in the middle. Yeah. Um, and now I'm back down getting towards back towards where I want to be. But oh, that's not just about, you know, wearing a certain thing that's about not wanting to die. And the fact that, you know, being an African-American, I am predisposed genetically to, yeah high blood pressure and heart disease and all those things, even though I'm vegan, I still have those things. If I eat ribs every day, it will even worse. Um, and so I try to be honest about the fact your husband dying kind of like, if anything's going to say, okay, you are not immortal, it's that. And so you can't deny it. And you can't say, well, this is something I'll worry about later. I also do want to be happy in the time that I have. And a lot of that comes into not worrying about what people think of what you do. Right. Um, I wrote about, um, I think I wrote about this um, about a year and a half after Scott died. I was like, I'll do something stupid. And mm -hmm. I hired a matchmaker and nothing came of that like relationship wise, but it was really helpful to be forced to sit across from a person and talk. Right. And I wrote about it and I had people emailing me at the newspaper going, it's too soon. And did you even love your husband? I'm like, the heck? <laughs> and so learning that those people are dumb and that's right. okay for them to have opinions, but they don't have to tell you about them. They do. You don't have to care about them. True. I don't care about what those people think of me. And I don't um, because I'm not going to let what some stranger say. Cause he was arguing with me and I, this guy was like, I'm a social worker and I work with a lot of single mothers. And right. when their men, friends die or leave or go to jail or whatever it is, you know, they date too fast and, it's bad for their kids. So I think you should not date for a long time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Be a mother. And I said, sir, thank you very much. It's been a year and a half. I know it probably doesn't seem the way to you since you were not in my house and you don't know me, but thank you. He goes, no, I think it's too soon. I'm thinking, delete. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, it's, listen, one of the things that you talk about in the book um, really kind of focused in on, again, everyone giving kind of solicited advice, unsolicited advice, um, you know, forgetting that what might work for them may not be the thing that works for you. Yeah. And so um, I just kind of wanted to touch on your mother, right? Yes. So your mother sounds like a really, really wonderful, oh, love. She's kind, great. And uh, actually her, her, her top. I bought this and I gave it to her. This is by a local designer, Manapurna, who I bought this to do an event. I think it probably was going to wear this to this event. Um, <laughs> and I just gave it to my mother because it looked better on her. So, um, okay. yes, okay. She, she is real in a way that I don't think I would have been able to quantify. And this is like the Hallmark movie of my life. I always loved her and I always liked her and I always liked spending time with her. But this experience has made us so much closer in a way because we really get each other as people, the people that we are now. I mean, I hadn't lived in the same house with her since I was 22, 23 okay. maybe. And so she moved in with us when I was 44, you know, so that's mm -hmm. a long time. And mm -hmm. now, you know, she just, when she gave me advice about things, it was, I mean, it's a lot of things. Like she's my mom. Right. She also is a widow. Mm -hmm. We also lost my dad together in different ways. You know, yeah. we lost Scott together, but in different ways. And she would never, even if it's not always 
exactly how I felt or the advice is not always the right advice. She would never say anything to me that she didn't think she knew or felt from a very authentic place. And I think that sometimes when people give advice, sometimes it's from where they are and sometimes it's like, I have to say something. I've got to, this person lost somebody. Mm-hmm. So you have to say something. So you say something about time and the wheel and the eternity and you know, <laughs> all that stuff, um, which isn't helpful to me. I mean, I'm right. sure there are people that it's helpful to because people wouldn't continue to say it. But maybe just no one ever said to them, don't say that. Or unless, yeah. unless you know exactly how it is that that specific person deals with the afterlife and spirituality and things of that nature, just say, I'm sorry for your loss, unless yeah. you know them. I mean, I had friends who knew me very well and were able to say, how are you feeling about those things? And didn't try to make it a hit and run. Scott has finished his cycle around the sun BS. Yes. Um, which when I read that statement in the book, I just kept thinking, this is so very true. Um, but going back to what you said, it's it, the thing about wisdom is that it's earned, right? So yeah. when you're sharing wisdom, it's coming from a place of earned experiences. It is. Um, know how and wherewithal. Um, touching back on your mother though, I talked to us a little bit about like what kinds of things or mantras or ways of living has she given you? Maybe share one or two that you grasp onto. <laughs> she often says, because I'll come in in the, like bizarre times of the night and I'll just start blah, and she'll go, little girl, breathe, <laughs> breathe. <laughs> And that's that's my best teenage student invitation. And it's true because I, not only am I not breathing the entire sentence, blah, 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 blah. right? It's also I'm not thinking about what I'm saying. Maybe I'm nervous about what I'm saying, so I'm like, go, and I just say it, or I haven't really thought about it. And maybe it's not even as big a thing as I thought it was. But she just wants. It's like you're literally going to die if you don't breathe. Um, that's a frequent thing. Also, she just kind of like. Sometimes when I'm like getting like this and she'll just hug me, she'll just yeah. hug me. like, and sometimes I think it's like subduing the prisoner, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like let's make sure the crazy person can't, is restrained. But no, um, that sometimes you just need that. And I know that in this time of social distancing and stuff, those of us who don't have anyone to hug and have that human touch from, I can't imagine. Um, yeah. I'm so, um, I'm so fortunate to have that, to have my mother and to have my son um, to just grab. And somebody's like, ah! But um, she just, sometimes, often, she'll come back to a conversation. Mm-hmm. Like that, which is a way of, of being wise. Like the next day, she'll say, so listen. And she remembers everything. She's a, you know, she's a psych nurse and a social worker and she's been a therapist she's and all these things. So she's really good at remembering these things. Right. But she does it in a way that's both, um, it's very wise, but it's not clinical and it's not accusatory or whatever. Um, and she's just really good at like, like a therapist will go, let's explore that. What you said. Yeah. Let's unpack that. Mother <laughs> handing you coffee or a cookie or something. Um, right. Yes. Oh, okay. I love it. I love it. I love it. I wonder, just kind of touching on bargaining and depression, right? So those are tricky ones Um, (laughs) because you could speak to it on the spiritual level, talking to God or whoever it is that you believe in. Um, You could also speak to the space of being stuck. So talk to us a little bit about those two things and how you kind of work through those stages. The bargaining thing never made sense to me in the the context of the stages of grieving being about death until I understood that when they were written, they were really about someone who has been diagnosed with with a terminal illness. Yes. Because in that context, the bargaining of if I do this, will you save me? If I appeal to God or a higher power to do charity work or stop drinking or start cheating on my wife or like exercise mm-hmm. every day or I, I'm never going to touch a piece of fried potato ever again. Right. So if that makes sense. 
when you're dead, unless of course you are digging them up to make a zombie thing to take to the ball with you, right, it's, right. To, um, it's, it's happened. But with me that the bargaining was like, was this because of me and did I do something? Am I doomed or bad things going to happen to me? So is this a warning? Is this like a Job thing or something? Ha Although Job didn't do anything either. Job just showed up and right. <laughs> mess with them, which is, I have right. so many questions about that. But is this is the thing where bad things are just happening to you either on purpose or did they just happen? And you go, well, what can I do to throw in the universe to make sure they never happen to me again? And mm -hmm. I did that because there were moments where I thought, okay, the adoption's not going to go through or I right. would um, this is going to go horribly with my mother and I'm going to be out in the street. I mean, and none of those things happened. And the, I had the power to make sure I did everything I had to do for the adoption. And then someone else was going to decide it. But I had the, uh, the, I was the person that controlled what happened on my end of my relationship with my mother. Right. So understanding that was very helpful because I cannot, you cannot help when people die. This is true. But you can, you can make sure that before people die, you have a good relationship with them. You can make sure that you have your ducks in a row for things like life insurance and practical stuff like that. And I think that realizing that I couldn't do anything about it, all I could do was just move forward was very helpful. The depression thing was hard because I am, you know, I'm like human jazz hands, you know. Yeah. So I am, I'm usually upbeat. I mean, I have my moments. I like depressing songs. I was like very much into all the Gloria Stefan songs in the eighties where she was, someone was leaving her and she was crying and stuff. I love that stuff, it's my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, sad, I have all kinds of sad playlists, but I am not that kind of depression. Although honestly, it started when my dad died. Um, yeah. That this world is upended in a way that I cannot get back. And this person mm -hmm. who is part of my life in so many ways, in so many huge ways is gone. I can't do anything about it. And then you start to think once, because we have to be in charge of something, what could I have done? What could I do? Was I, was I, a, I would call my mother and go, was I a good daughter? And she'd go, Oh my God, you wore just, uh, you know, stop it. <laughs> you know, um, and you make things about you, <laughs> you make things about, um, okay. you know, what you could do. Um, therapy was so important to me. It Absolutely. was, it was just, it was, I, I had been in therapy before Scott died, not at that moment, but I had had therapy in the past and I knew I was going to have to have therapy. I knew that the therapy of um, reestablishing a, a religious um, worship thing. And I still don't go every week. Well, nobody goes anywhere right now, but mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. frequently, and I have a relationship with a church. I had stopped that for a while after my dad died because I was mad. Yeah, um, but those things were helpful to me. Um, being a writing, like I said, was so therapeutic. And honestly, just being able to speak out loud, like I would have these like Lieutenant Dan fights with God, you know, yeah. like Forrest Gump. I'm sorry, everything folks is a pop culture reference. Um, right. <laughs> sorry, but I, I would, I would have these fights with God. I remember I can see myself and I felt so stupid when I was doing it, but I, like, I just had to, where I was like sink, I sunk next to the floor next to the chair that Scott used to sit in his Archie Bunker recliner. And I was like, and Sally Field and Steel McNeil, I'm like, why? You know, it was right. like, and I'm sobbing and I'm like, I'm gonna wake people up. I don't care. <laughs> and I just, and I looked up and I had neither been struck by lightning right. <laughs> or had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. There was no bright light. I didn't go, oh, it's all great. but. I got it off of my chest and I thought, it's okay to feel that way. It's okay. Absolutely. Going back to the anger part, it's okay to be angry. It's okay mm -hmm. to be, um, that's how we're made. We're made to try to deal with the horrible things that happen to us in the best way that we can. Absolutely. And not hold on to it. I think that that's the, yeah. the big part for me was um, to your point, right? There was there was this level in conversation that I kept having with God around, why is this happening? And why would this happen to the strongest person we've ever known? Oh um, the most important person who's done everything she could to make sure that her kids got to where they needed to be um, and weren't fulfilling some sort of stereotype, for example. Yes. Um, yes. One of the most powerful quotes that I just, 
keep staring at it and looking at it, um, but it spoke volumes to me. And let me read it here. I believe in magic and in God and in miracles. I want a miracle. Please give me a miracle. There's something there with I believe in magic because when you see the the person that you love the most um, pass away, there's a there's a spectrum of 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 uh, sadness that comes across yeah. you because you believe that person is this superhero that yeah. nothing happened to them because right. why would you know? Talk to us a little bit about that statement and how are you feeling about it now? And I still do believe in magic. I still believe. But magic doesn't happen the way that you think it's going to all the time. Right. You know, magic doesn't believe that nothing bad will ever happen to you. Mm -hmm. Everything that you ask for is going to be granted. And that's the thing that I had to, it's the whole like when bad things happen to good people situation, yeah. you know, but I'm a very good person. Mm -hmm. I, usually 95%, 87%. <laughs> and I felt like, why would this happen? And so you would, you are used to read fairy tales that bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people, bad things happen to good people until something miraculous happens. The prince comes, the dwarves save you, the dragon, right. gets home, whatever. And mm -hmm. then you realize, and here's once again, here's my pretty woman thing. Um, sometimes you have to save yourself True. And you have to save the other person. And then maybe you got to like help the dragon punch his way out too, you know? Um, but I believe that that strength comes from somewhere. And I, I, I believe in everything. I believe that God is real. And I believe that things, magical things happen that we don't know how they happen and we can't explain, but they just sort of like appear and that there's a timing to it. Um, and that miracles can be like, I've repaired relationships mm -hmm. since this that I had not repaired before. That's awesome. And I don't, one of two of them I know are, this happened and it, it happened to both me and the person and we kind of had to like find our way back yeah. to each other that way. And then some, I have more patience. I have more patience for a lot of things. I have mm -hmm. less patience for a lot of things. I have more patience for humans that you know, you look at that person in the DMV line or in the McDonald's drive through you go, I don't know what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. happened. The worst thing in the world could have happened in the day, and they still have to show up and go to work because they had to. And maybe it's not about me. Maybe right. they're that they gave side eye, and I didn't. It wasn't about me. It was they're really trying to breathe their way through the end of the shift, and they're right. capped by seconds, and they want to go home. Um, I have less patience for like um, I mentioned before when we were talking about you have people telling you when you should do this and what's appropriate and whatever. I don't care about those people, and I have a lot less patience for. Um, this is in the book, things I don't want to do. Like what people would literally say in the first couple of weeks, do you want to go whatever? I would go, no, I don't. <laughs> and that was the Bible. Like my brain was incapable of pretending I wanted to be. But now I've started, to, I, I say no to almost every committee that I'm offered. Yeah. Because I just don't have time and I don't want to. Right. I, I think these things, and these things are wonderful. It's just in my life, I have a full-time job in newspaper. I have a full-time job writing and then promoting this book full-time job as a mom now as a paraeducator mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. as a person who's trying to work out a lot and not die and right. just a woman who likes to experience stuff that's on obligation and i with all those things it's nice that people think of you and want you to be on their committees and do this stuff but lately like the last several months i have said no to so many things that either were not incredibly important to me or that weren't promotional for me. Right. That's my right. job. <laughs> and, I don't feel, and I don't feel bad about it. You shouldn't feel bad about it. Um, I mean, there's a level of self-awareness that um, whether you're going through a hard time, a tragedy, whatever the case, a loss of a job, whatever the case may be, there's a level of self-awareness that goes into understanding what's best for you. Um, and a lot of this book kind of also touches on uh, that aspect of moving from how tragedy starts to the latter stages of that. Yeah. Um, and with that, I kind of want to throw out there to everyone that's live streaming right now that yeah. we're getting ready to get into a question and answer portion. So please yeah. feel free to throw your questions out there and we'll see if we can get them answered. But before we do that, we have about a minute before we jump into that, Leslie. Um, tell us two things that people should know about Scott. 
Scott was without a doubt the smartest person I've ever met in my life. And it's funny because when you would meet him, he would seem like this kind of goofy, happy go lucky, hey, let's he would like make word puns like a dad joke, or whatever. And but he did that to make people feel at home. He did that to make to disarm people. I have a friend who said that we would go to polo and I would write about polo and the celebrities and stuff. And Scott would go stand next to him mm -hmm. and laugh. And he, when Scott died, he said, I remember Scott as a person who said, I know both of us feel weird in this situation. Let's just laugh and feel comfortable with each other. And right. then he disarmed people. Also, he was um, joyous about things that he didn't know about. He had never been to polo. I didn't really either. But mm -hmm. like he was like a, a sports guy. He was a sports guy. He liked a lot of other things, but that's the thing that he liked. But he went to concerts with me. He went to the opera with me. He didn't love the opera, but he yeah. went. Mm -hmm. and he said, can we go somewhere? Oh, yeah, we're fine. Um, but he did things because they were important to me. And he did things because he was hungry about experiences. Like I said, it wasn't guaranteed to like everything. Right. He wasn't afraid to give it a shot. He wasn't afraid to look stupid. Absolutely. Um, and that made him look great because he was fearless about this. I'm going to throw it in there. And if I get a pratfall, then maybe you'll laugh. Wow. It just seemed like he was the, when I was reading the book, I just kept thinking, this is the person when you walk into the room, um, you know, you're there with him and he, he throws a drink out to you and, um, you know, we'll, he can talk to you about sports or jump in about any cultural experience that either he was interested in. So, um, I loved it. I loved reading this book. I recommend everybody to grab a copy because it is worth it. Um, and so I think we're going to, oh, yes. And look at mine, my book here. It has all the speed. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let me throw out this first question um, from Camille, Camille Corpus. I hope I'm saying your name right. I lost my husband and my mom around the same time in 2018. And I've been writing about my experience since then. What advice do you have for someone who would like to write a book similar to yours? And first of all, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about your, your both, both of your losses and I'm glad that you're here. Um, I would say the first thing to do is just write and not worry about the structure and not worry about do these words make sense <laughs> together? Just right. write in your heart. I mean, the first chapter I literally wrote maybe a month after Scott died, which was like, I literally just been in the graveside and now I'm writing about it. Um, cause a, it's therapeutic B, if you're trying to write a book about it, you need to get it out there and it might take a completely different shape than you think. And I don't know if you've ever written uh, professionally or written a book or whatever. Um, but some of the most beautifully raw things are the things that you just kind of did. And so my advice would be to just be honest about how you feel, not to censor yourself. I mean, I wrote things that never made it in the book. Like, I hate this person. They suck. I'll punch them in the face. And I knew that wasn't. And some of it, most of it, I deleted before I even showed it to anybody. Um, there were things that happened, like at the um, at the hospital, that were a lot. That chapter was a lot longer because I was I had grievances for everybody. Right. And I took most of that out. It, you got the gist of it, and I didn't need to go into all of it. But don't censor yourself. Just write it down, and see how it it goes for you but good luck to you. And if you have any questions, um, I, you can find out how to email me. I'm, you can go to my website, lesliegracetreater.com and my contact information is there. Thank you, Camille. Let's take another question. Anthony G, thank you so much for coming. I had a question. What was the inspiration behind your book cover? Okay, this book cover it's so funny. This is I have the, the geniuses at Little Brown and Hachette found this. We had all these conceptual covers that were like, I had this idea that didn't come out funny at all. That was like, wouldn't it be? Because I wanted to say, okay, death but funny. So I was like, wouldn't it be like? Uh, they they drew it up actually. And were very nice about when I was like, no, um, it was my fault. There was a limo and a hand with sticking out of the limo holding um, a martini. But that seemed like a beach read, like the Black Widow was a 25 year old who married the rich guy, poisoned his drink and was spending his money. So right. that was bad. And <laughs> one thing, and that was my idea, it was bad. Um, their idea, and they didn't even, they said, we'll come up with something. And I think that it was, because everything in about it, doesn't necessarily say widow, but it says something bad has happened, I don't wanna deal with. It says black, cause look at her beautiful hair. Right. This was um, stock art. This wasn't even like a photo shoot, but look at that. People, is that you? I'm like, 
My hair don't do that. Um, I wish it did. But, and, and this, it's kind of like, it says, it looks like a comic book almost. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something not, it's something very eventful about it, but it's not tragic or sad about the type even. They did an amazing job of it. They've yeah. done an amazing job. I love that. I love that. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Okay, next question is coming from Tracy Capiello. I hope I'm saying your name right. How can we nominate someone else to handle those things when it comes to like accepting sorry, sad looks, and et cetera? You know what I did? I kind of like, because I got my, I had gotten married five years before, and most of my bridesmaids and stuff were able to come to the funeral. I kind of did what I did when I got married, where I just kind of delegated. My sister laughs all the time that she said the day before her, my wedding, I went, okay, I'm officially out of this. Y'all figure it all out. I'm the bride now. I literally had 10, nine bridesmaids and my friend Jason. So I had a very large bridesmaid party and all my family, and I was like, handle it, handle it. And I think <laughs> that, that same kind of thing came, because I, I said to my sister was my point person. I said, listen, I don't know what's going on. I, I really don't know what my brain is doing any one time. And she goes, I got it. Mm -hmm. And she find the person that you trust, find the person that you know is not, and knows and the person that you trust, the person whose opinions are like yours. So they're probably not going to say, you know, Leslie loves that song and she doesn't. <laughs> you know, it's that, you know. Someone who knows, a well, knows you well enough to know what it is you want. And I would just kind of grab people and say, can you remember to tell someone something? And they go, got it. And I just, I have so many really capable friends. But yeah, I think, and I wrote this in something too. Find a person who is a point person that you would have do anything. Like maybe who was your bridesmaid or your, you know, your plan, your baby shower. Someone who's good at stuff like that and good at delegating. And who also is good at being authoritative because because everyone loved me, just like when my dad died. Everyone loved my mom. So everyone had opinions right. about things. And my mother wasn't always able to be present. So they would come to us and say, we've decided we're going to whatever. And we would go, no. <laughs> you just know, that wasn't either what the plan was. There was a plan. Or mm -hmm. we knew that that was something that wasn't necessarily going to be something that she would like or that my dad would have liked. So we were able to, because we were the daughters, go, yeah, no, thank you so much. But no, we would love to have you. Do you have other flowers? Whatever, thank you. Thank you, you don't even, thank you so much for helping. Because you want to make sure that people feel and know that you appreciate that they don't have to do any of this. Absolutely. You know, very quick story. I am a vegetarian. I was a vegetarian, I'm vegan. And at the time I had never recreationally eaten pork. So my father died in Little Rock, Arkansas. So pork is a very big thing. So my mother was finishing her mas her master's degree in nursing at the time. And she was gone and everyone was in and out of the house, whatever. So the church members come over and this lady knocks on the door and she's so proud of this dish. And she says, this is a pork butt. <laughs> and I don't know anything about that. I go, thank you. And right. she like pork butt. Right. <laughs> and, I, and, she, and she looks at me and she goes, no, it, it's a pork butt. I was the wrong person to do this at the time. And she and I said, and I'm going to tell my mother about thank you so much. So she's really confused, slightly insulted. I don't know why. She closes the door and I yell upstairs, including to my Jewish husband who did eat ham and say, there's a pork butt. And literally everybody in the house started coming down that way where they were opening drawers and knife opening things and knife and stuff and whatever. It's like, ah, because they knew it's a really special cut of meat. Takes a long time to make. It's expensive. It's a whole pork, but it's really great. And so my mother called her friend and said, thank you so much, sister so-and-so for bringing the pork, but my daughter's a vegetarian. She didn't. And she goes, oh, okay. No, say no more. Say no more. But, um, I was in most things, the person to be not in the pork butt situation, um, but in most things, I hope I go, I was glad to be that person. Just find that person to, and trust them. And they'll come back later and tell you things that went wrong. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll take one last question before we decide to close out here. Oh, from Molly Spellman. What are healthy things you do to cope on the bad days? Oh, wow. Um, let myself cry that during this isolation period, um, I have found more and probably because I'm writing, talking a lot about this because I'm writing, written the book and, you know, promoting it. And so it brings these things up. I have had moments where I just talk to Scott. I just lie in the dark and I talk to him, you know, and I 
that's been really helpful to me. Yeah. And I feel him in his presence. I don't hear like his voice, like in a movie, like, ah, da, 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 da. but right. I feel him. And that's very helpful to me. Also, um, just letting yourself feel what you feel and not telling yourself that it's too far. You're, you're too far past it to feel this way. So it's wrong and you have to pretend you don't. Um, that's not how grief works. That's not how hearts work and how mm -hmm. that's not how humans work. Right. And giving yourself a freaking break, I think is the most healthy thing that I've ever done. Go on walks by yourself. Don't be afraid to get away from the people in your house and say, I'm claiming this 10 minute walk around the block for me. Um, take a bike ride. I love my bike. Um, right. Just, I find that solitude either to do something in or nothing at all and allowing myself to be at peace in that yeah. is the healthiest thing. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of the questions, all of the comments. Leslie, you're going to close us out with one statement around the last stage of grief, which is acceptance. Oh my gosh. That's about accepting not only that the loss happened, but accepting where you are in the loss. It's about saying you don't have all the answers. It's about accepting that you are not a perfect person, that you will cry, that you will still have moments five years, 10 years, 15 years later, where you go, the heck was that all about? But it's accepting the fact that you are healed, that you're, you're healing, you are loved, and you are able to get through this because that person loved you and you love them enough to miss them. And that's, that's how I've been able to do it. And the accepting that there are things that you can't change. The only thing you can change is the here and now and the future. And you got to go from there. Well, with that, Leslie, we thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I thank you so much for sharing so much about yourself for this amazing book that I hope that everyone is looking into grabbing for themselves. Um, and to everyone that joined the live stream and to all of the future folks that'll, that'll tune into this link because this is a recorded session, I send you nothing but light, love, hugs, and um, positivity for the rest of the year. Thank you again. Thank you.